welcome uh, to the Wall Exchange. My name is Janice Sarah, and I'm the uh, director of the Peter Wall Institute for Advanced Studies and a professor of law. The Wall Exchange is a series of downtown lectures sponsored by the Peter Wall Institute of Advanced Studies at the University of British Columbia. And it's really dedicated to trying to advance innovative and fundamental research by bringing people together in a fulsome conversation about timely topics that are highly important to us as members of society. And certainly tonight's conversation promises, I think, to uh, generate a provocative and, and, and stimulating debate. I'd like to thank the Georgia Strait Magazine for co-sponsoring uh, this event, and to thank CBC Radio One Ideas Program, uh, its producer, Kathleen Flaherty, and her crew for taping the event. So we're going to have it on CBC broadcast on the Ideas Program. <laughs> I would ask you to um, please turn your cell phone ringers off. I know people might be uh, tweeting and things, but uh, we'd really like not to have the noise. <laughs> Um, so just briefly to talk about the program this evening, uh, Dr. Butler is going to speak for about uh, 50 minutes. Uh, Charlie Smith will then serve as moderator for a 45-minute question and answer period. Charlie Smith is an accomplished journalist, senior editor of the Georgia Strait, and former associate producer of CBC Radio 1. It gives me great pleasure uh, to introduce Judith Butler. Dr. Butler is the Maxine Elliott Professor in the Departments of Rhetoric and Comparative Literature and co-director of the Program of Critical Theory at the University of California, Berkeley. She holds the Hannah Arendt Chair at the European uh, Graduate School in Switzerland. She received her PhD in philosophy from Yale University and has been awarded the Brudner Prize for Lifetime Achievement at that university. Judith Butler has been called simply one of the most probing, challenging, and influential thinkers of our time. One of America's preeminent philosophers, she has challenged the foundational beliefs that anchor our cultural norms. A prolific scholar of diverse interests, she has published significant works on feminist and queer theory, literary theory, modern philosophy, uh, political ethics, mourning, and of course, war. Dr. Butler applies her extraordinary theoretical knowledge to real-world situations, and her ideas and insights have both informed and transformed current thought. She currently holds the Andrew Mellon Award for Distinguished Academic Achievement in the Humanities. In her recent article entitled, Dr. Butler wrote on precarity, embodiment, and the politics of public space. To quote her, when bodies gather as they do, they express their, uh, to express their indignation and to enact their plural existence in public space, they are also making broader demands. They are demanding to be recognized and to be valued. They are exercising a right to appear and to exercise freedom. They are calling for a livable life. These values are presupposed by particular demands, but they also demand a more fundamental restructuring of our socioeconomic and political order. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Butler. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm uh, enormously pleased to be here in Vancouver today. And I want, first of all, to thank the Peter Wall Institute for this um, wonderful invitation. I'd like also to acknowledge that we are on the traditional lands of the Coast Salish peoples. I'm particularly um, uh, um, grateful to um, Joanna Forbes and Janice Sarah of the Peter Wall Institute, the Wall family, including Sonia Wall, who I believe is with us uh, this evening, and the kind people at the Vogue Theater at Georgia Strait, and of course, the fabulous uh, people of Vancouver. Thank you. Um, I have said that I would speak about bodies in the street, and. That is surely what I 
plan to address, but I want to take a moment with you to pause and think about what such a lecture can be and attempt to set aside some of the misconceptions that can easily arise from such a title. It may be thought that I will say that bodies in the street are a good thing, uh, that we should celebrate mass demonstrations and that bodies together on the street form a certain ideal of community or even a new politics worthy of praise. Though sometimes bodies assembled on the street are clearly cause for joy, even for hope, let us remember that the phrase bodies on the street can refer equally well to right-wing demonstrations, military soldiers assembled to quell demonstrations, and to forms of military occupation. So from the start, we have to be prepared to ask, under what conditions do we find bodies assembled on the street to be cause for celebration? Or what forms of assembly actually work in the service of realizing greater ideals of justice and equality? Minimally, we can say that those demonstrations that seek to realize justice and equality are worthy of praise. But even then, we are called upon to define our terms since, as we know, there are conflicting views. <clears throat> about justice, to be sure, and there are sure, and there are many disparate ways of thinking and valuing equality. Two more problems immediately present themselves. In certain parts of the world, political alliances do not or cannot take the form of street assemblies. Think about conditions of intense police surveillance or military occupation. Crowds cannot swell on the streets without risking imprisonment, injury, or death, and so alliances are sometimes made in other forms, ones that seek to minimize bodily exposure to violence at the same time that demands for justice are made. Hunger strikes within prisons, as we recently saw in Palestine, are forms of resistance that must take place in spaces of enforced confinement. They are themselves bodily demands for public space and public freedom. So let us remember that heightened bodily exposure is not always a political good, or at least not always the most successful strategy. The Israeli occupation of Palestine is a case in point. Further, we have to consider as well that some forms of political assembly do not take place on the street or in the square precisely because streets are not at the center of that political action. For instance, a movement may be galvanized for the purposes of establishing adequate infrastructure. We can think about the continuing shanty towns of South Africa, Kenya, Pakistan, in sites constructed outside the border of Europe, but also the barrios of Venezuela or the baracas of Portugal. These are more often than not groups of people, immigrants, squatters, and or Roma, who are struggling precisely for running water, working toilets, paved streets for work and provisions. Indeed, the street is not the only site that we can take for granted for certain kinds of public assemblies, because the street is also a public good for which people fight, an infrastructural necessity that forms one of the demands of certain forms of mobilization, and I would add certain forms of mobilization against precarity. And yet I think we can see that in such situations, with or without streets, some basic requirements of the body are at the center of political mobilizations. We could certainly make a list of those. Bodies require food and shelter, protection from injury and destruction, freedom to move, um, employment, health care. Bodies require other bodies for support, for passion, for survival. And it matters what age those bodies are and whether they are able-bodied, since in all forms of dependency, bodies require not just one other person, but social systems of support that are complexly human and technical. 
But if I say this, then another set of questions emerge. Emerges, are we speaking only about human bodies? And can we speak about bodies at all without the environments, the machines, and the complex systems of social interdependency upon which they rely, which form the conditions of their existence and survival? And finally, even if we come to understand and enumerate the requirements of the body, do we struggle only for those requirements to be met? Or do we struggle as well for bodies to thrive? It is one thing to demand that bodies have what they need to survive, and indeed survival is a precondition for all the other claims we might make. And yet it seems that we survive precisely in order to live, and life, as much as it requires survival, must be more than survival in order to be livable. So how do we think about a livable life without positing a single or uniform ideal for that life? It is not a matter, in my view, of finding out what the human really is or what the human really should be, since it has surely been made plain that humans are animals too and that their very bodily existence depends upon systems of support that include human and non-human dimensions. So to a certain extent, I follow my colleague Donna Haraway in asking us to think about the complex relationalities that constitute bodily life and to suggest that we do not need any more ideal forms of the human, but rather complex ways of understanding those sets of relations without which we do not exist at all. Perhaps I've gotten ahead of myself or perhaps I keep lagging behind the topic that forms the purpose of my remarks this evening. But I wanted to pause at the beginning to make sure that there are no unnecessary misunderstandings. Although there are those who will say that active bodies assembled on the street constitute a surging multitude, one that in itself constitutes a radical democratic event or action, I am only partially in agreement with that view. There are all sorts of surging multitudes I don't want to endorse, and they would include racist or fascist congregations and mass movements. I don't think the point of politics is simply to surge forth together, constituting a new sense of the people, although sometimes for the purposes of radical democratic change, which I do endorse and for which I struggle, it is important to surge forth in ways that claim and alter the attention of the world. Something has to hold together such a group, some demand, some felt sense of injustice, some lived experience of the possibility of change, and that change has to be fueled by a resistance to minimally existing and expanding inequalities, ever-increasing conditions of precarity for many populations, both locally and globally. Resistance to forms of authoritarian and securitarian control that seek to suppress democratic movements. On the one hand, there are bodies that assemble on the street or online or through other less visible networks of solidarity, especially in prisons, whose political claims are made through language, action, gesture, and movement through linking arms, through refusing to move, to forming bodily modes of obstruction to police and state authorities, in making contact in ways that are difficult to trace. And in this sense, we can say that these bodies form networks of resistance together, remembering that bodies are not just active agents of resistance, but also fundamentally in need of support. So those movements, when they work, provide provisional support in order to facilitate the broader demand for forms of support that make life livable. So on the one hand, bodies assemble precisely to show that they are bodies, and they let it be known politically what it means to persist as a body in this world, what requirements must be met for bodies to survive, and what conditions make a bodily life, which is the only life we have, finally livable. So on the one hand, as I'm saying, bodies form in networks of resistance. On the other hand, as I hope to make clear, 
bodies form in order to produce not only structures of support and independency, but to evince or enact ideas of community and equality for which the movement struggles. It's not only or primarily as abstract subjects bearing rights that we take to the streets. We take to the streets because we need to walk or move there. We need streets to be structured so that whether or not we are in a chair, we can move there, and we can move there without obstruction, harassment, administrative detention, fear of injury, or death. If we are on the street, it is because we are bodies that require infrastructural support for our continuing existence and for living a life that matters. So if I caution against an easy celebration of active bodies, I am also cautioning against the idea that activism requires that we think of the body only as active, as agentic. If the body were by definition active, then we would not need to struggle for the conditions that allow the body its free activity in the name of social and economic justice. And though I do not want to rest easily with an idea of the body as vulnerable, or indeed as passive, I do think that we cannot understand the forms of interrelationality that constitute our bodily lives if we do not understand the complex relation between vulnerability and those forms of activity that come to constitute our political resistance. Indeed, even in the moment of appearing on the street, we are vulnerable. This is especially true for those who appear on the street without permits, who are opposing the police or the military or other security forces. One is shorn of protection, to be sure, but this does not mean that one is reduced to some sort of bare life. On the contrary, to be shorn of protection is a form of political exposure, at once concretely vulnerable and potentially defiant. How do we understand this connection between vulnerability and defiance within activism? Of course, feminist theorists have for a long time argued that women suffer social vulnerability disproportionately. And though there is always a risk in claiming that women are especially vulnerable, given how many other groups can certainly make that claim, there is perhaps something important to be taken from this tradition of argumentation. The claim can sometimes be taken to mean that women have an unchanging and defining vulnerability, and that, and that kind of argument makes the case for paternalistic protection. If women are especially vulnerable, then they seek protection. It becomes the responsibility of the state or other paternal powers to provide that protection. On that model, feminist activism not only petitions paternal authority for special dispensations and protections, but affirms that inequality of power that situates women in a powerless position and by implication men in a more powerful one. Or it invests the state with the responsibility for facilitating the achievement of feminist goals. Such a view is very different from one, from one that claims, for instance, that women are vulnerable and capable of resistance, that vulnerability and resistance can and do happen at the same time, as we see in certain forms of feminist self-defense, or even in certain openly political movements of women in the public sphere where they are not generally allowed to appear. We can think of the slut walks, or we can think about those who oppose harassment or injury by virtue of appearing as they do. This would, in my mind, also include Muslim women wearing full veils in France who are um, unjustly subject to uh, to uh, arrest and, f and, and, um, and fines. Of course, there are good reasons to argue for the differential vulnerability of women. They do suffer disproportionately from poverty and literacy, two very important dimensions of any global analysis of women's condition. So when I'm asked, for instance, are you a post-feminist, I say, well, um, as long as women suffer disproportionately from, from poverty and literacy and are disproportionately vulnerable to violence, I am still a feminist. 
So the question that emerges and forms the focus of my question here is how to think about the vulnerability of women in conjunction with feminist modes of agency and how to think both in light of global conditions and emerging possibilities of global alliance. This task is made all the more difficult as state structures and institutions of social welfare lose their own resources, thus exposing more populations to homelessness, unemployment, illiteracy, and inadequate health care. So the struggle, in my view, is how to make the feminists claim effectively that such institutions are crucial to sustaining lives at the same time that feminists resist modes of paternalism that reinstate relations of inequality. In some ways, vulnerability has been regarded as a value in feminist theory and politics. This means neither that women are more vulnerable than men nor that women value vulnerability more than men do, Rather, certain kinds of gender-defining attributes like vulnerability and invulnerability are distributed unequally and for purposes of shoring up certain regimes of power that disenfranchise women. We think about goods as, as distributed unequally under capitalism. We think about opportunities distributed unequally under capitalism. We think about natural resources, especially water, distributed unequally. But we should also surely consider that one way of managing populations is to distribute vulnerability unequally in such a way that vulnerable populations are established within discourse and policy. More recently, we note that social movements and policy analysts refer to precarious populations and that political strategies are accordingly devised to think about ameliorating conditions of precarity. As we extend the economic notion of unequal distribution to broader social and cultural spheres, we are also confronted, especially during times of war, with the uneven grievability of populations. That is, the idea that certain lives, if lost, are more worthy of memorialization and public grieving than others. Populations targeted for injury and destruction in war are often considered ungrievable from the start, but so too are populations whose labor is episodic and precarious or who are considered abandoned through systematic forms of negligence. When vulnerability is distributed unequally, then certain populations are effectively targeted as injurable, with impunity, or disposable, without reparation. This kind of explicit or implicit marking can work to justify the infliction of injury upon them, as we see in times of war or in state violence against undocumented citizens or we can see such populations as responsible for their own position or conversely in need of protection from the state or other institutions of civil society. It's important to note that when such redistributive strategies abound, then other populations, usually the ones orchestrating or affecting the processes of redistribution, posit themselves as invulnerable, if not impermeable and without any such needs of protection. This approach takes vulnerability and invulnerability as political effects, unequally distributed effects of a field of power that acts on and through bodies. If vulnerability has been culturally coded feminine, then how are certain populations effectively feminized when designated as vulnerable and others construed as masculine when laying claim to impermeability? Once again, these are not essential features of men or women, but processes of gender formation, effects of power that have, as one of their aims, the production of gender differences along lines of inequality. This has led psychoanalytic feminists to remark that the masculine position, construed in such a way, is effectively built through a denial of its own constitutive vulnerability. This denial or disavowal requires the political institution of oblivion or forgetfulness, more specifically, the forgetting of one's own vulnerability, its projection and displacement elsewhere. <clears throat> 
the one who achieves this impermeability erases or externalizes all trace of a memory of vulnerability. The person who considers himself, by definition, to be invulnerable, effectively says, I was never vulnerable, and if I was, it wasn't true, and I have no memory of that condition. <laughs> An obviously contradictory statement, it nevertheless shows us something of the political syntax of disavowal. But it also tells us something about how histories can be told in order to support an ideal of the self one wishes were true. Such histories depend on disavowal for their coherence, and this coherence is also thereby rendered suspect. Although psychoanalytic perspectives such as these are important as a way of gaining insight into this particular way that vulnerability is distributed along gender lines, it only goes part of the way toward the kind of analysis needed here. Since if we say that some person or some group denies vulnerability, we are assuming not only that the vulnerability was already there, but also that it is, in some sense, deniable. Of course, one cannot make an easy analogy between individual and group formations, and yet modes of denial or disavowal can be seen to, tra to traverse them both. For instance, to certain defenders of the military rationale for the destruction of targeted groups or populations, we might say, you act as if you yourself were not vulnerable to the kind of destruction you cause. Or to defenders of certain forms of neoliberal economics, you act as if you yourself could never belong to a population whose work and life is considered disposable, precarious, who can suddenly be deprived of, bas of basic rights, of access to housing or health care, or who lives with anxiety about how and whether work will ever arrive. In this way, then, we assume that those who seek to expose others to such positions of vulnerability, or those who seek to posit and maintain a position of invulnerability for themselves, deny a vulnerability by which they are, in fact, bound to the ones they seek to subjugate. This last claim, it's a claim I'm willing to make, moves in the direction of a common or shared vulnerability. But this is meant less as an existential thesis than as a general claim about how bodies are in invariably dependent upon enduring viable social relations and institutions for their survival and their well-being. Although this claim can be understood as an existential one, it belongs, in my view, more properly to the articulation of a social ontology that I am trying in a preliminary way to suggest can become the basis for new forms of coalition, one that we see episodically instanced in the contemporary politics of the street. Even though I see the two levels of this analysis, I want to suggest that these are not two forms of vulnerability. Rather, I want to argue that, first, bodily vulnerability presupposes a social world, that we are, as bodies, vulnerable to others and to institutions, and that this vulnerability constitutes one aspect of the social modality through which bodies persist. And then secondly, I want to suggest that the issue of my vulnerability or your vulnerability implicates us in a broader political problem of equality and inequality, since vulnerability can be projected and denied, psychological categories, but also exploited and manipulated, social and economic categories, in the production of inequality. This is what is meant by the unequal distribution of vulnerability. Vulnerability constitutes one aspect of the political modality of the body, where the body is surely human, understood as a human animal. Vulnerability to one another, that is to say, even when conceived as reciprocal, marks a pre-contractual dimension of our social relations. 
This means as well that at some level it defies the instrumental logic that claims I will only protect your vulnerability if you protect mine, according to which politics becomes a matter of brokering a deal or making a, cal a calculation or strategically entering into a contract. In fact, it constitutes the conditions of sociality and political life that, I would argue, cannot be contractually stipulated and whose denial and manipulability constitutes an effort to destroy or manage a condition of potential equality. I don't mean to suggest by this last formulation that there's a single subject sovereign who allocates vulnerability differentially or unequally. These modes of allocation and even disavowal can be built into institutional rationalities and strategies and so become forms of power that operate without the, the conceit of a single deciding subject. And so, Efforts to challenge and contest these issues, something that happens more often than not under the name of precarity, takes aim not only at individuals who make policy, but more fundamentally at the forms of rationality, representation, and strategy that inform this condition. So the way this differential allocation of vulnerability works doesn't always presuppose a dyadic frame one person or group does something to another. On those occasions when there are groups who do not appear at all or who do not count, whose bodies do not matter, then the institutionalized forms of effacement at issue cannot readily be described through recourse to the category of the subject. So it's not that one subject does this to another, whether the subject is understood as singular or plural, it's rather that a set of strategies um, uh, produce the situation in which a population cannot appear as a subject at all. In the US, for instance, the history of native peoples tends to fall into this category, and the history in Canada is, of course, related yet distinct. Native peoples are described in given discursive life through national narratives about the founding of the Americas, and yet this very description, these very narratives, more often than not become the means of effacement. As we know, since Spain was an imperial power before the US, that the colonization of the Americas brought with it acts of slaughter and killing that are regularly denied on what is still called in the US Columbus Day. And now, um, of course, there is a popular movement that has achieved rather widespread success in renaming that day Indigenous Peoples Day. When we speak about effacement, we are also speaking about the regulation of memory and entering into another formulation of disavowal. <coughs> Excuse me. There was no slaughter or radical dispossession, and even if there were, I do not remember it, or there is no reliable archive, or it is not among the histories that any of us know or tell. But if we were to enter that history into a comparative study of genocide or a comparative history of forcible displacement, then we would, we would see how the killing of whole populations in Congo and Nazi Germany and Armenia in the early part of the 20th century, or the mo more recent histories of the disappeared in Chile, Argentina, or even the political murders of Franco Spain, regularly become matters for historians to dispute. Will there be an institutionalized memory or not? And in such cases, it's not a matter of memory as something that is held in the mind by someone who has experienced this destruction directly. Rather, it is a memory that is maintained through historical record, through discursive and transmittable means, through documentation, image, and archive. To preserve the memory of the vulnerability of bodies under such conditions requires a form of memorialization that must be repeated and reestablished over time and space. And this means that there is no one memory, that memory is not finally a property of cognition, but rather that memory is socially main maintained and transmitted through certain forms of documentation and exhibition, through media. <laughs>
In this sense, we might say that the historical vulnerability of those who were exploited, whose land was confiscated, or whose lives were lost, is always at risk of disappearing. This is why Walter Benjamin thought there, that, there, that a struggle must be waged for the history of the oppressed, precisely because under modern conditions, that history runs the risk of disappearing always into oblivion. It is this Benjaminian maxim that was and is enacted by the Madres de Plata del Mayo, who beginning in 1977 started to meet every Thursday in that large square in Buenos Aires, the site of Argentina's government, publicly to protest the disappearance of their children, those suspected of activism against the dictatorship. Illegally and persistently, they walked in nonviolent demonstrations taking back public space and even making use of their public exposure as mothers precisely to defy the regime. As they walked, they chanted, we want our children, we want them to tell us where they are. The madres said, no matter what our children think, they should not be tortured, they should have charges brought before them, we should be able to see them, visit them. The movement and numbers of women whose children had disappeared grew, and in and their weekly demonstrations, in those demonstrations, some carried pictures of the missing children. Later, they wore white scarves to, sell, to symbolize the white dove of peace, which they argued can unite all women. And yet this movement was neither primarily identitarian nor maternalist. It opposed the brutality of the regime, and even when the regime finally fell in 1983, they continued weekly, and even continue now, with other generations joining them to protest any forgetting of that brutality and for trials that will bring all the torturers to justice. Suffering, memorialization, and political resistance mark that ongoing public demonstration, and yet it is also a demonstration that claimed public space when it was forbidden and claims it still, maintaining it as a political right. So I hope I am now able to make clear at least two points about vulnerability that seek neither to idealize nor to discount its political importance. <clears throat> The first is that vulnerability cannot be associated exclusively with injurability. That all responsiveness to what happens, including the responsiveness of those who document the losses of the past, is a function and effect of vulnerability, of being open to a history that is not told or being open to what another body undergoes. We can say that these are matters of empathy, but I want to suggest that part of what a body does, to use the phrase of Deleuze, derived from his reading of Spinoza, is to open onto the body of another or a set of others, and for that reason, bodies are not self-enclosed kinds of entities. They are always, in some sense, outside themselves, exploring or navigating their environment, extended and even sometimes dispossessed through the senses. If we can become lost in another, or if our or visual or auditory capacities comport us beyond ourselves, that is because the body does not stay in its own place and because dispossession of this kind characterizes bodily life more generally. It is also why we have to speak sometimes about the regulation of the senses as a political matter. There are certain photographs of injury or destruction of bodies in war that are often forbidden to be seen precisely because there is a fear on the part of the, the state that regulates such matters that somebody will feel something about what those other bodies underwent or that somebody in its sensory comportment outside itself will not remain enclosed, monadic, and individual. Indeed, we might ask what kind of regulation of the senses, what I would call modes of ecstatic relationality, might have to be regulated for individualism to be maintained as an ontology required for both economics and politics. <clears throat> 
This is also why certain forms of public documentation in print and media, in museums and art spaces, or even the art space of the street, become important in the battle against historical oblivion. My last point here is that the body canon does become a site where the memories of others are transmitted. No memory is preserved without a mode of transmission, and the body is a point of transfer in which your history becomes mine, or where your history passes through mine. I do not have to experience your history, history to, to transmit something of your history. The temporality of your life can and does cross my own, and a certain operation of translation makes that possible, one that does not purport to translate everything. It is also because we are, or can be, bound up with one another, which is very different from being bounded as individual subjects. Thus the possibility of transmitting a memory under political threat, the political threat of oblivion, depends upon the transitivity of that memory. It's taking shape and exercising an effect on bodies that were not there and could not be there. This is not the same as the kind of testimony given by those who were there, but it does suggest that testimony depends upon transmission to survive in time. Thus, we might see the ways that the memories of others arrive for us, or even in us, as a mode of relationality. We might further understand this capacity to receive and convey what the other documents about history as a function of our own corporeal relatedness across time and space to those whose words we carry. We carry them in ourselves. Those, history become part, those histories become part of who we are, but we also carry them in spite of ourselves. So we're not just, as bodies, these spatial and bounded creatures. We can never transcend that boundary completely, I, I agree. But we are also the histories that we never lived, but which we nevertheless transmit in the name of the struggle to preserve the history of the oppressed and to mobilize that history in our struggle for justice in the present. When, for instance, the Israeli government prohibits, prohibits any mention or memorialization of the Nakba, the forcible dispossession of more than 750,000 Palestinians from their homes in 1948, often in the middle of their meals or in the middle of their night, with no warning and no justification in order to produce domiciles for Jewish citizens of the new state, what precisely are they doing? They are surely seeking, through passing a law, to regulate memory, to consign an historical and persisting form of dispossession and suffering to oblivion, and to refuse the historically demonstrated link between the forcible dispossession of one people in order to produce a liberatory narrative for founding a nation for another. It would be one thing if the dispossession happened once, but it inaugurated forms of land confiscation and transfer that happened continually. And as we see in the expansion and legalization of the illegal, of the illegal settlements, indeed all the settlements are illegal, the redrawing of territorial lines, and the new demands for loyalty oaths on the part of Palestinians to Israel as a Jewish nation, and even in, in the now very public debate about transferring those Palestinians who still live within the boundaries of Israel to the occupied territories. Of course, there are many different histories to be told here, and I cannot do justice to, the, to any of them this evening. But what I want to suggest in a more modest way is that in all of these struggles, the body is central. It is central to um, uh, the fight for the history of the oppressed, the fight against oblivion. What has happened to bodies is being transmitted through various media, and those who openly struggle against the effaced past are themselves in a bodily position of vulnerability being impressed upon by a history, and in this sense, being outside themselves, even in spite of themselves, as they carry what belongs to others. No history can be inscribed on a body or conveyed through it without vulnerability. An inscription makes the body bend, cave, suffer, and respond, even take 
new form in light of that pressure. The body then is not is to be thought not as substance and enclosure, but perhaps as site of injurability, receptivity, passionate exposure, even ethical transport. So I propose to return now to the question of vulnerability and to understand what relation it might have to contemporary coalitions and how the body figures prominently in any idea of coalition we may imagine for the present. Although we often speak this way, I do not think we can consider vulnerability as a purely contingent circumstance. Of course, it's always possible to say, oh, I was vulnerable then, but I'm not vulnerable anymore. Sometimes that's even true. And we say that in relation to specific situations in which we felt ourselves to be at risk or injurable. They can be economic or financial situations when we feel that we might be exploited, lose work, find ourselves in conditions of poverty. Or they can be emotional situations, certainly the political ones are emotional, or the economic ones are deeply emotional too, in which we are very much vulnerable to rejection, but later find that we have lost that vulnerability. It makes sense that we speak this way. Vulnerability seems episodic. It also makes sense that we treat with caution the seductions of ordinary discourse at such moments. Since though we may feel that we are vulnerable in some instances and not in others, the condition of our vulnerability is itself not precisely changeable. At most, there are times when our vulnerability becomes apparent to us, but that is not the same as saying that we are only vulnerable at those times. We can be vulnerable without knowing it, and indeed, that not knowing it is part of vulnerability itself. Vulnerability cannot be understood restrictively as an affect restricted to a contingent situation, nor can it be understood merely as a subjective disposition, as a condition that is, I would suggest, coextensive with human life, understood as social life, understood as creaturely life, and as bound to the problem of precarity, Vulnerability is the name for a certain way of opening onto the world. In this sense, it's not, it not only designates a relation to the world, but it asserts our very existence as a relational one. To say that any of us are vulnerable beings is to establish our radical dependency, not only on others, but on a sustaining, sustainable world. This has implications for understanding who we are as passionate beings, as sexual, as bound up with others of necessity, but also as beings who seek to persist and whose persistence can and is, can be and is imperiled when social, economic, and political structures exploit or fail us. Drawing on the work of Hannah Arendt, Adriana Cavarero, the Italian philosopher, tells us that one of the key moments of politics, what we might even identify as its constitutive ethical moment, is the emergence of the question, who are you? We ask this question implicitly or explicitly when we seek to bring a population into discourse or establish a language of representation. It's not necessarily a single person who poses this question an institution, a discourse, an economic system that asks, who are you, seeks to establish a space of appearance for the other. To ask, who are you, is to avow that one does not know in advance who you are, that one is open to what comes from the other, and that one expects that no pre-established category will be able to answer in advance the question that is posed. Indeed, I would suggest in a certain Levinasian way, the question, who are you, has to remain an infinitely open question, unanswerable, in order to remain an ethical one. It will be important to keep active the relationship between the various meanings of the precarious if we are to think how vulnerability relates to coalition during this time. Precariousness is a function of our social vulnerability, the condition of our exposure that always assumes some political form. Precarity is differentially distributed, and so one important dimension of the unequal distribution um, of conditions required for a livable life. 
precaritization is also an ongoing process, as Isabel, Isabel Lorre has argued. Precaritization allows us to think about what Lauren Berlant has called the slow death undergone by targeted or neglected populations under conditions of neoliberalism. And it is surely a form of power without a subject precaritization, which is to say that there is no one center which propels its direction and force of destruction. If we only considered the term precaritization, I'm not sure we could account for the structure of affect that is named by precarity. And if we decided to rally under the name of the precarious as a new identity or community formation, we might then, be, we might then draw attention away from the globally specific ways that precarity is lived as a social and political condition cloaking some way that form of power actually works. So maybe precarious is what we feel or would rather not feel, and then its analysis has to be linked to the impetus to become impermeable, as so often happens within the discourse of military nationalism and the rhetoric of security and self-defense. And yet it will be important to call precarious those bonds that support forms of life those that should be structured by the condition of mutual need and exposure that bring us to forms of political organization that sustain living beings on terms of equality or at least dispose them toward equality as an ideal worth struggling for. What seems finally more important than any form of existential individualism is the idea that a bond is flawed or frayed or that it is lost or irrecoverable. And we see this, I think, very prominently when, for instance, um, the, the Tea Party politicians in the United States overtly rejoice, um, uh, um, over, uh, rejoice about the idea that individuals who have failed to take responsibility for their own health care may well face death and disease as a result. Apparently, this was, this was mentioned at a, at a Tea Party congregation, uh, people who don't take responsibility for their own health care will face death and disease as a consequence of their lack of responsibility, and the group rose up and clapped joyously, joyous clapping, rejoicing, rejoicing. We have to think about that particular affect. Maybe the affect studies people will help us. Okay, at such moments, I want to say, I want to say, at such moments, a social bond has been cut or destroyed in ways that uh, deny a shared precariousness, the very particular ethos and politics that ideally should follow from, um, um, from that is one that underscores uh, local and global interdependency and actively resists the radical radically unequal distribution of precarity and grievability. Okay, so it's, I mean, of course, yes, we need to think about um, sadistic forms of joy at the thought of other people lacking health care and dying as a consequence, but, but what we really need to see, I think, in that moment is that um, the precarity of the one who takes that sadistic joy is also denied, as well as the bond the, the bond of interdependency with the one whose death is being joyously imagined. Such a struggle would be at once opposed to forms of securitarian logics as well as the old and new paternalisms that are now linked to the promise of security. But this resistance can happen only if modes of coalition grounded in interdependency um, uh, the, and, the, and struggles against precarity and for equality exercise power in ways that break with the lure of paternalism. This cannot mean refusing all forms of state and institutional support. That form of anti-institutional politics unfortunately allies with the destruction of social democratic goods and the idea of economic rights. And these forms of destruction, the destruction of those goods and rights, are precisely those that are being of course, undertaken and produced by neoliberalism and securitarian politics alike. So yes, one must struggle for social democracy, but in the context, I would suggest, 
of a radical democratic politics, and they are different. We cannot presume that interdependency is some beautiful state of coexistence. It's not the same as social harmony. Inevitably, we rail against those on whom we are most dependent, and there is no way to dissociate dependency from aggression once and for all. These may not even be happy alliances or, or particularly joyous coalitions, but they are constituted from the insight, I would say, the insight from the, from the, from the, from the condition um, of, of a pre-contractual set of relations that pertain to social embodiment. We require one another to live. This means that our survival and well-being uh, both are invariably negotiated in the social, economic, and political spheres. Indeed, our negotiations are the very sites where those spheres converge and lose their distinctness. We can make this idea popular by seeking recourse to broad existential and humanist claims. Well, everyone is precarious. But once we ask about what this means or what forms precarity assumes, we see that we have from the start left the existential domain to consider our social existence as bodily beings who depend upon one another for shelter and sustenance and who therefore are at risk of statelessness, homelessness, and destitution under unjust and unequal political conditions. In other words, precarious defines our existence as political beings. Our survival depends upon political arrangements and politics, especially as it becomes biopolitics and the managing of populations, is concerned with the question of whose lives will be preserved, protected, and valued, and eventually mourned or regarded in advance as potentially mournable, and whose lives will be considered disposable and ungrievable. In this way, our precarity is to a large extent dependent upon the organization of economic and social relations. The presence or absence of sustaining infrastructures and social and political institutions, modes of struggling for them that produce and sustain alliances. So what I'm trying to suggest is that precarity is indissociable from that dimension of politics that addresses the organization and protection of bodily needs. Precarity exposes our sociality, the fragile and necessary dimensions of our interdependency, and this has implications for how we join together in struggle when we do. No one escapes the precarious dimension of social life, that is, we might say, our common non-foundation. Indeed, nothing founds us outside of a struggle to establish those bonds by which we are sustained. So when people take to the streets together, they form something of a body politic. And even if that body politic does not speak in a single voice, even when it does not speak at all or make any claims, it still forms, asserting its presence as a plural and obdurate bodily life. What is the political significance of assembling as bodies, stopping traffic or claiming attention, or moving not as stray and separate individuals, but as a social movement of some kind. It does not have to be organized from on high, the Leninist presumption, and it does not need to have a single message, the logocentric conceit, for assembled bodies to exercise a certain performative force in the public domain. The we are here that translates that collective bodily presence might be read as we are still here, meaning we have not yet been disposed of. Such bodies are precarious and persisting, which is why I think we have always to link precarity with forms of social and political agency where that is possible. When the bodies of those deemed disposable assemble into public view, they are saying, we have not slipped quietly into the shadows of public life. We have not become the glaring absence that structures your ordinary life. In a way, the collective assembling of bodies is an exercise of the popular will and a way of asserting in corporeal form one of the most basic presuppositions of democracy, namely that political and public institutions are bound to represent the people and to do so in ways that establish equality as a presupposition 
of social and political existence. So when those institutions become structured in ways, in such a way that certain populations become disposable or are interpolated as disposable, deprived of a future, of education, of stable and fulfilling work, of even knowing what space one can call a home, then surely the assemblies fulfill another function, not only the expression of justifiable rage, but the assertion in their very social organization of principles of equality in the midst of precarity. I am aware that the fate of the Egyptian revolution remains uncertain and sometimes extremely dispiriting, especially as the transitional military government refuses to honor its deadlines for ceding to civil rule, even in the midst of our elections, or the elections we're seeing right now. Indeed, it continues to unleash its police force on demonstrators and retain power over who may or may not run for election, who may or may not be accepted as elected. I want to underscore, nevertheless, two aspects of the revolutionary demonstrations in Tahrir Square that emerged so clearly in the winter before last, and which still, despite all odds, continue to this day. The first has to do with the way a certain sociability was established within the square, a division of lab labor that broke down gender difference, that involved rotating who would speak and who would clean the areas where people slept and ate, developing a work schedule for everyone to maintain the environment and to clean the toilets. In, sh in short, what some would call horizontal relations among the protesters formed methodically and even easily introducing relations of equality into the very form of resistance. Those included an equal division of labor between the sexes and became part of the very resistance to the Mubarak regime and its entrenched hierarchies, including the extraordinary differentials of wealth between the military and corporate sponsors of the regime and the working people, and those subject to the violence of police forces and to the Baltagea, hired thugs that do the government's dirty work. So the social form of the resistance began to incorporate principles of equality that governed not only how and when people spoke and acted for the media and against the regime, but how people cared for their, very, their various quarters within the square, the beds on pavement, the makeshift medical stations and bathrooms, the places where people ate, the places where people were exposed to violence from the outside. These actions were all political by breaking down conventional distinctions between public and private in order to establish relations of interdependency that were supportive and sustaining. In, in this sense, they were incorporating into the very social form of resistance the principles for which they were struggling on the street and um, for the future. The second, the second dimension of, of, of that assembly I want to call attention to is the careful relation to violence. When up against violent attack or extreme threats, many people chanted the words silmiya, which comes from the root verb salima, which means to be safe and sound, unharmed, unimpaired, intact, safe and secure, but also, interestingly, to be unobjectionable, blameless, faultless, and yet also to be certain, established, clearly proven. The term comes from the noun silm, S-I-L-M, which means peace, but also interchangeably and significantly the religion of Islam. One variant of the term is hub as silm, which is Arabic for pacifism. Most usually the chanting of silmiya comes across as a gentle exhortation Peaceful, peaceful. Although the revolution was for the most part nonviolent, it was not necessarily led by a principled opposition to violence. Rather, the collective chant was a way of encouraging people to resist the mimetic pull of military aggression and the aggression of the gangs by keeping in mind the larger goal, radical democratic change. To be swept into a violent exchange of the moment was to lose the patience needed to realize the revolution. What interests me here is the chant, the way in which language worked not to incite an action, but rather to restrain one. The chant structures affect in the direction of community and nonviolence, calling for and enacting a nonviolent mode of politics. 
Of course, an ambiguity emerges precisely there, since resisting a violent attack does take some force. One has to sometimes forcibly resist a forcible attack. And this means that nonviolence is not a form of passivity, but rather the thoughtful cultivation of forceful resistance that refuses to replicate the aggression it opposes, and where restraint itself must be understood as the nonviolent cultivation of force. Although some may wager that under conditions of new media or social networking, the exercise of rights now takes place quite at the expense of bodies on the street, that Twitter and other virtual technologies have led to a disembodiment of the public sphere. I disagree, and as I've argued elsewhere, I want to suggest that the media requires those bodies on the street to have an event, even as the street requires the media to exist in a global arena. But under conditions when those with cameras or internet capacities are imprisoned or tortured or deported, then the use of the technology effectively implicates the body. Not only must someone's hand tap and send, but someone's body is on the line if that tapping and sending gets traced. In other words, localization is hardly overcome through the use of a media that potentially transmits globally. And if this conjuncture of street and media constitutes a very contemporary version of the public sphere, then bodies on the line have to be thought as both there and here, now and then, transported and stationary, with very different political consequences following from these two ways of being positioned in space and time. Finally then, bodies on the street are precarious. They're exposed to police force and sometimes endure physical suffering as a result. The risk is there and it seems to be increasing now that police regularly clear out the encampments of the Occupy movement through forcible means or, or clamp down on free assembly um, uh, 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 supported by uh, laws and policies that claim that free assemblies are security risks, one way to obliterate a fundamental right. Those bodies are also obdurate and persisting. They insist on their continuing and collective thereness or hereness, and in these recent forms, organizing themselves without hierarchy and so exemplifying the principles of equal treatment they are demanding of public institutions. In this, way, in this way, those bodies enact the message performatively, even when they sleep in public or when they organize collective methods for cleaning the grounds they occupy, as happened both in Tahrir and Zuccotti Park. If there's a we who assembles there, at that precise space and time, there's also a we that forms across the media that calls for the demonstrations and broadcasts its event. So some set of global connections are being articulated, a different sense of the global from the globalized market. And some set of values are being enacted in the form of a collective resistance, a defense of our collective precarity and persistence in the making of equality and the many voiced and unvoiced ways of refusing to become disposable. When this happens, we act from a sense of precarity. We also act against a sense of precarity. We act in coalition and often in unchosen proximities to people we've never chosen to be close to. Indeed, in a situation where a pre-contractual interdependency is at work. Sometimes this is experienced as a relief and an exhilaration. Sometimes it is uneasy and conflicted, but it is, in my view, always necessary and sometimes promising and alive. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Butler. Uh, my name is Charlie Smith. I'm editor of the Georgia Strait. And we have two microphones, one on the left and one on the right. So if people want to ask questions, they can go to the microphone.
And I'll just start with one question to get things going. Uh, Dr. Butler, why is it that so many people in North America seem to have difficulty acknowledging their own precarity? <laughs> would, you, would you agree with that, though? Well, it's not very much fun, is it? <laughs> I can follow up with another question. <laughs> um, no, I'm, I'm happy to answer your question. Um, although I, I'm not sure I could answer in a satisfying way, but, 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 um, but, but certainly, I mean, I, I do think um, that there are uh, forms of amassing wealth um, and uh, economic and political um, security and protection that are very much about producing um, the possibility of lives that will not be um, touched by other lives or, 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 or lives that will be um, Im impermeable to incursion, right? We can think about gated communities, but we can also think more generally um, about uh, um, forms of, of, of militarism or nationalism that are stoked by the ideal of, of, of never being attacked or never, um, never having anyone um, come into one's territory who might do harm. And I think one can find it as well in virulent um, anti-immigration discourses. Um, and um, and I'm not sure um, that most people would understand themselves as dealing with a situation of precarity at such moments, but in fact, um, I think uh, that there's, um, there's a, a specter of being destroyed or of being destabilized or of being um, penetrated or aggressed upon that does um, uh, suggest uh, a level of uh, enormous political anxiety that 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 focuses on um, on the body um, and 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 the capacity of the body to be um, suddenly aggressed upon or to to, to be entered to be um, uh, uh, to 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 ha to have its its um, solidity and control um, threatened at a at a very um, fun fundamental level, um, and um, and and I and I do think that it is a political strategy to um, to effectively externalize and deposit that felt sense of precarity um, in in other populations and to try to keep other populations precarious, especially those um, who are who are in some sense feared or loathed. And of course, um, people in dominant, in dominant positions who do that know that they are also all the more subject to aggression from those they subjugate. So what they actually end up doing is increasing their own felt sense of precarity through a mode of subjugation that is unlivable for those who, who, who live it. So, um, you know, I, I, I think we could, we could answer the question at both a psychological and a political level, but my, my, my wager is that the psychological and the political work in tandem. Um, it's not always easy to show how that works. I'm not interested in a kind of group psychology exactly, but I am, um, but I am uh, interested in see seeing how that can work out. I don't, I don't know if I answered your question. <laughs> okay, so what we'll do... I think you did. I think it's, it's, um, I would say you did. So it's, I mean, I'll try again. Yeah. I'm happy to try again. No, well, there is the psychological aspects, too. Yes. And that um, failure to acknowledge, um, you know. But what I'll do is we have people who want to ask questions, and where, what, I would ask each person who asks a question if you could keep it relatively concise so that we can get more questions in the amount of time available. So we'll start on the right. Um, one of the chants I heard at the Occupy movements in Vancouver was the people united will never be defeated. 
And if there's one thing I learned, it's that in that instance, the people were defeated. And maybe you might disagree with me, but we need only refer to our mutual friend Hegel and the battle between the law of the heart and the way of the world to graph onto this. See, what I think can be characterized is the fact that we have the law of the heart, the occupiers, keeping in reserve the virtue, the fact that the people will never be defeated, while the way of the world will always triumph over that because of the nature of it being a sham fight to this extent. My question is, is this Hegelian characterization correct? And if so, to what extent will these occupiers and these carceral archipelagos need to traverse the fantasy that nonviolence can actually edify radical democratic change? Okay, you know, I, my guess is that others heard you better. You were standing just a little bit too far away from that microphone for me. But I, okay. I and I understand it, but I, I got it that it was very articulate, but I'm just. <laughs> but I'm, I, I, what I understand you to have said is that the, 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 the so-called occupiers were falsely believed that um, if they remain united, they would not be defeated, but indeed they were defeated, which means that there's something wrong with the tactic. But what I don't understand is what you're, you're claiming is wrong with the tactic. What I'm claiming is that the, the movement is subject to a fantasy that nonviolent change can actually edify radical democratic change. Is that correct? And if it is not correct, where am I going wrong? Okay. Um, well, look, first of all, um, as far as I'm concerned, the Occupy movement is not over. Um, and, but the Occupy movement is, has to work um, through certain kinds of, um, in, 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 a, in, in, in an episodic way. And uh, the encampment uh, episode has been an extremely important one. The end of encampments is not the end of the Occupy movement. Um, and the real question is, what are the new strategies? And, and, and what are the new ways of um, occupying buildings um, uh, temporarily or um, producing demonstrations or continuing to get the word out in, in different ways? So. So, um, you know, I think we have certain ideas of what success is. Oh, Occupy Movement failed because police power came in and wiped them out, um, and they were defenseless against police power. Now, you could say, oh, they needed to take arms, or what we need is an armed revolutionary struggle, or, or something along those lines. Um, but I think... Um, I think, in fact, what we are seeing is the, con uh, the, the contours of a, a new form of the conflict. Remember, what, what really began as a movement that was trying to draw attention to differential um, uh, uh, levels of wealth, and in particular showing that the rich are getting richer and fewer, and the poor are getting larger and poorer, um, suddenly found itself up against police power, right? And the, the analysis of police power and the resistance to police power was not at the forefront of the movement and suddenly became at the forefront of the movement when public space was taken back by the state time and again through forcible police action. So now, and, and it seems to me that in, um, in many of the student movements as well, which are to a certain degree linked to Occupy and to a certain degree independent, we're also seeing um, uh, police action against free assembly. And I gather the new Montreal law has actually now um, effectively criminalized protest um, as uh, uh, as a kind of security threat, which is, to me, extremely frightening. So um, the real question for me is, okay, what's, what now, uh, we're, we're not just dealing with differentials in wealth, we're also dealing with um, a state, a, a, a set of um, economic and state powers that are invested in the destruction of dissent 
and legal assembly through using the violent arm of the state, which is the police, and, um, and, that pol and those police forces are increasingly in several cities, as we know, um, uh, um, be being, being trained by military forces. So we actually have the militarization of the police and the criminalization of protest happening at the same time, which means that the analysis of power and the ways of resisting that power are, are going to have to adapt. But we're in the middle of a process. We're in the middle of a process. And, um, and, it, and it's also a problem because um, traditional modes of civil disobedience and nonviolent resistance are no longer being recognized as legitimate. So for instance, on the Berkeley campus when people handed you know, they actually, you know, gave the police their wrists, thinking, okay, you know, uh, handcuff me, take me away, this is what's done, this is what happened in the civil rights movement. Um, they were thrown to the ground and beaten, which, which is an, an historically really important moment, given free speech at Berkeley, um, because what it, what it effectively said is, says is that um, traditions governing uh, uh, non nonviolent civil disobedience are no longer being honored. Um, it seems to me that the only way to overcome that kind of m militarization and criminalization of protest is through making protest more indomitable, making it larger, making it global, making it overwhelming, so that the the actual legitimacy. Um, of the state is called into question. Um, I think there. Are, I, I. I think we would have to have a longer discussion about violence and nonviolence. And what I was trying to suggest briefly today is that nonviolence is not just passivity. It is the cultivation of the force of resistance. And and in that sense, it in, it involves bodily action, pressure, and and um, presence. And it is not simply taking it. But. I, we, we need more time for that. Okay. Uh, the next question on my left. Hi. Okay, um, I don't know if this is a big question or if it's actually a pretty straightforward question, um, but just thinking about leftist politics, it is related to the last question on Occupy. Um, any kind of leftist or progressive politics, whatever we want to call it, um, it seems to obviously be, in, when it's up against right-wing politics, it's necessarily fragmented because of our recognition of difference within a group. And then um, I've often thought of your notion of strategic essentialism in terms of a way of bringing a group together. And then something like Occupy, um, I just kind of want to ask you, with, some, uh, with kind of a phrase, um, we are the 99%, um, as a kind of example of what I understand to be strategic essentialism, um, I would ask, if it, do you think that that has proven a kind of politically efficacious form of the use of strategic essentialism, or do we lose something in something like we are the 99%? Mm. Um, well, I don't think um, we are the 99% is strategic essentialism because it doesn't say that our being 99% is essential to who we are or um, is the only basis on which we m mobilize together. Um, I think, in fact, um, it seeks to be a kind of umbrella term that is supposed to actually include all kinds of differences without um, asserting economic oppression as more primary than all other forms of oppression. So I saw it as trying to circumvent the more classical leftist um, uh, effort to, uh, to make economic oppression primary and, and then to have secondary um, oppressions. But of course, as we know, within many of the encampments and within the movements, there are struggles about race, about sexuality, about gender. Um, and, and, and I guess I want to say um, that those struggles are absolutely necessary um, and that we shouldn't lament them. I don't think we should, we should think, oh, it's too bad. We're still having those struggles and we're not yet unified. I think if we're having those struggles, that is what unity means. Unity means struggling, right? And so, you know, um, I, 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 I tend to kind of res resist 
um, the, the language of fragmentation, even though sometimes it's exactly right, right, that groups do leave. They can't be in co coalition together. It's impossible. Um, and yet, it seems to me that hanging in, hanging in, um, in coalitions where it's not easy and when, where those issues continue to remain open and where there's, there's open conflict and struggle, that's, that's, what we, that's what is meant by unity. Unity is not uniformity. Unity is agreeing to stay in and struggle or finding that the struggle is worth it, not just because mm, different groups need to recognize each other or understand each other better, but because the stakes are really, really high. Uh, because what is happening economically and politically is, is absolutely unacceptable, and one has to keep that in mind at the same time that one is engaged in that open-ended struggle. Okay. Now the question on the right. Um, I, first of all, I never, I never felt so vulnerable at asking a question. Uh, <laughs> you're, so. you're safe with me. <laughs> um, just the vulnerability as a choice and being a, a student here as an immigrant and a queer migrant, um, the, the first thing that I was told when I attended a student, uh, international student meeting was never to attend a protest or any sort of uh, social or political uh, event. And uh, ways of like, uh, so I'm, the tactics of fear uh, applied to, by the state, but also by the institutions to depoliticize migrants uh, as a way of preventing any action to happen. That's one of, and, and um, but also the vulnerability as a choice. So every time I go to a protest, which I do all the time, there's a choice of me of being, uh, a greater choice of actually being deported if anything goes mm. wrong. Mm. So there's that, that, there's always that fear, but also vulnerability as a, as a place of birth of any resistance. So how do you play that performative side of performativity within like the tactics that are applied by the state and by the institutions to depoliticize migrants? Mm -hmm. Good question. Um, seems like you could probably tell me more about that question that I could tell you. But I, 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 do, um, I do think um, that, um, the, that the, the effort to depoliticize migrants as you've described it is also um, a certain kind of training in good citizenship. Right, and we have to um, ask what version of citizenship is being inculcated at such moments, um, and whether um, whether you're also being asked to um, um, accept um, implicit forms of censorship as the precondition of your membership, um, and and that's that's really tricky. You don't even need a law to say you you know you you may. I mean, of course. There's the problem of the law, but there, there doesn't even have to be an explicit censoring. Um, but I think, in fact, um, uh, um, one I, I, I've had these conversations um, with um, with students on the on the East Coast in the U.S. Um, who did a number of public public actions. They were undocumented, and they did public actions that that did put them in a precarious position, but also drew attention to the precarious position they were in and which was for them not acceptable, right? And, and so we, we have to think about both dimensions of that. And what was interesting is that certain students could do it, and those were the ones who, for whatever reason, felt that their chances of deportation were less or that they were possibly protected by the institutions they were part of, or who are willing to take the risk for whatever reason, and others felt they could not do that, but wanted to support the effort in ways that didn't necessarily put their own bodies on the line. And let's remember that every public demonstration requires its non-public support system, <laughs> right? There's a non-public support system, and there's a way to be supportive and to be, you know, to be, to be assisting and to be Active um, uh, in 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 ways that 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 feel ma manageable, depending on what the level of political risk really is um, um, for the individual or for the for the group. So, so I don't think there's one 
I don't think there's simply one form of, um, of, of, of being mobilized on that issue. And one has to, and, and who, no, one can prescribe, no one can prescribe to you what risk to take, but if someone tells you never to take a risk, then you, know, you have to wonder what norm is being inculcated at such a moment. Allowing permanent, like permanent residents can know, like can be actually deported if they're, uh, like even citizens that went through a process of refugee or permanent resident before yes. uh, could be deported. Like there's no, it, the, the status of permanent resident or, or citizen is not even, like it goes farther than just being a, a I'm an, aware. An I'm, we, we now have retractable forms of citizenship. Yes, these are the retractable conditions of citizenship and they are expanding. And, 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 and that is, that, that, is um, that, that is hugely worrisome and, and, and very, very difficult. I understand that. Okay, we'll go to a question on the left. Hi, Dr. Butler. I don't have a specific question, but I was wondering if you could speak to what you said earlier in your lecture about the link between feminization of um, different uh, nations and, oh, I'm totally drawing a blank here, <laughs> the vulnerability of those nations. So mm -hmm. just the link between the two, I was wondering if you could uh, speak briefly about those, because I was curious about that. Um, well, I suppose, um, you know, let me just, you know, cl clarify that I think, um, you know, I'm, in, in a way, I'm 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 saying two things at the same time, and I want to be able to say them both. And one is that um, vulnerability is something like a shared condition that cannot be denied. And I also want to say that vulnerability is a condition that is denied all the time. Um, <laughs> and uh, and and I I I, I do I, I don't think we can deny what is not in some sense there. The, the link that I was making in my own mind was one of physical safety. I don't know if Physical was, safety? Yeah, because uh, physical safety is a concern for many women. I mean, it's a concern for everybody. But I was wondering if that was something that you were thinking of when you made those well, links. Well, what I did have in mind um, is that um, certain forms of torture um, that, that took place um, under the Bush administration involved, um, invo involved efforts to, f to feminize um, um, the, 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 the bodies of, um, of, of Ar Arab men in, in outsourced um, prisons. And, um, and I think that it's a very complex issue, um, the way in which torture uh, work to to um, emasculate at the same time that it identified or consolidated the idea that um, that those who are tortured are uh, homosexual or women <laughs> like you become a homosexual you become a woman by by being tortured and that the effect of the torture was to do that so it it was operating within that idea that the worst possible social position or the position of intense vulnerability would be that um, um, of, a, of, of a homosexual um, or, or of a woman. So, so that, kind, that kind of subservience was what you were Well, that kind of um, inability to protect yourself against right. um, violent assault. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we'll have two more questions. Uh, one over here. We only have, oh, we've got, we'll have three more. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, I just, uh, thank you. I just wanted to know what your thoughts were on the connection between physical violence in protests, whether on the side of protesters or the authorities, um, and the, its connection with vulnerability. So for example, could it displace the vulnerability of those protesters, or does it rather reveal the vulnerability of both the protesters and the otherwise impermeable um, authorities at the same time, or just what your thoughts were generally between the connection on physical violence in protest and the vulnerability which uh, you spoke of. Ah, okay. 
Um, in general, um, I think um, I, I am, I, I support non, nonviolent forms of resistance. Um, at the same time, I want to say uh, that one of the most important things for me as a, um, uh, and indeed for many people in my generation, um, was, was, was learning forms of, um, of self-defense and um, that I wouldn't be okay on the street if I didn't know that I had um, skills of self-defense. Um, when we think about self-defense, and we think about it on the street, we think about it in demonstrations, we think about it what, when, a, when a policeman is coming at you with a baton, or when you are being sprayed, um, uh, of, of course there's a right to self-defense, and the question is what form does that take? And um, what I'm most interested in are collective forms of support at moments of police attack so that people, uh, they link together to make it difficult for the attack to take place or they support one another or they actually catch each other or, um, uh, or interpose themselves in front of one another. There are, there are ways of thinking about self-defense not just as an individual practice, uh, which m many of us had to learn, but also as a kind of collective practice. And it is, um, it's a delicate and difficult practice. Um, and I don't think anyone can completely prescribe it in advance, although there are a lot of people who have worked on this for a very, very long time. And there are other social movements to, to, to reference at this moment, especially in South Africa. Um, so I think uh, using the body as a force to stop a blow or to um, to, to deflect a blow is extremely important. At what point does that become a blow? What's, what's the defense and what's the, what's the, what's the, the act? I want to say that there's force on all sides of that and that there's no way, especially in the confrontation with the police, that we can eradicate the field of force. We can only navigate the field of force as eth ethically and, and carefully as we can. Um, uh, and sometimes our acts of self-defense will be called provocation. They will be renamed after the fact and videos brought, like, oh, that's a provocation. Well, it seemed to me that person's being beaten. That's a pro Don't you see the left? You know, but there's no way to control it, especially in the visual, you know, documentation. There's no way to fully control how it will signify. Um, and, and that is, of course, a huge problem. Um, and I'm also aware that politically self-defense works in some ways that I don't agree with, right? So that um, highly militarized nations can say they had to assault a population out of self-defense. Uh, or they use self-defense to legitimate every act of aggression. So self-defense can become an alibi for aggression. So the, I, don't, I don't have a good answer for you. All I want to say is that it's a very vigilant practice to, to insist on self-defense and to make sure or, or to try as hard as possible um, for it not to be an alibi for, um, for, 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 for the kind of violence we are opposing, right? Because the whole point is not to replicate the violence one opposes, to, but, it, but to stop the violence, right? That, that's it. I was just wondering if you could explain when you say that the Tea Party, for example, has a vicious appreciation for the vulnerability of the other, of those who are um, not going to be able to afford health care and such, and you say that that actually exemplifies their own vulnerability and the fragility of their own states. I'm wondering why then you included right-wing protest in your caveat as to why not all bodies on the street are positive and you included them with violence and with military and with repercussive um, bodies on the street. 
Um, just, just tell me that again. What, well, the question is, why? Why do you include right-wing protests and right-wing demonstrations in your caveat about why not all bodies on the street are a positive thing? Why is it, I, it seemed to me that you were saying that left-wing protests that occupy movements and such are a good thing to have, and yet it seems that you think things, I see protests like t Tea Party and things I see. aren't positive things to have. I see what you're saying. Okay, I'm sorry. That's, okay, it's a good question because it helps me clarify something. Um, um, I, I, am, I am in favor of the freedom of assembly. I am very anxious right now that the freedom of assembly is being taken away in many parts of the globe and um, that securitarian logics and um, and, and, and state and economic interests are very interested in quelling um, freedom of assembly. So I am in favor of freedom of assembly, which means that I want the right to be enjoyed by people who are on the left and the right. And I probably even defend the right of some pretty horrible people to collect you know, on the street, okay? But the fact that I defend the right of right-wing people to collect on the street, including the Tea Party, as I absolutely do, because you know there's a big liberal core to my leftism. Um, <laughs> well, you know, I mean, we are what we are, right? We come out of we come out of complex histories. But anyway, there is one I do defend their right, and I would write against it, and I would abhor it, and I would hate it, but I wouldn't take the right away. Right? And, and that's, that's the line. That's the line. Um, so, uh, um, and when I started the talk, I, I said, look, I'm, I'm not rejoicing. I'm not going to rejoice about the Tea Party on the street. I'm not going to oppose it legally. And I'm going to oppose any legal effort to restrain them from, per, from, from going on the street. But I'm not going to celebrate. That's all. Okay. We're basically out of time, but you've been very patient, so if we can make this really quick, that would be terrific. Okay, well, I, I was interested in, um, you're, you're talking about vulnerability as a pre-contractual um, thing that we share. Oh, is it off? Hello? Ah, there. Okay, sorry. Mic check. Um, so you, you, you were... Um, saying that vulnerability is a pre-contractual shared state. Uh, and I'm, I'm interested in um, thinking about the language of contracts um, in the context of what you're saying, because it seems in a certain way um, contracts are a way of denying vulnerability in that they imply we have control. Like, we, we get to say this is what we're entering into, and then we're taking responsibility of what happens to us. Um, it... it, it Caught, allows for a just world hypothesis. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, this sort of contractuality, which easily ends up in um, shoring up neoliberalism, um, often invades language of consent, whatever sort of consent, sexual consent, um, medical consent. And um, I think that there... I need a Sorry. <laughs> um, Obviously, there's something really important ethically about consensuality and about consensus, and I'm wondering if you have any um, uh, insight into how, how we should talk about that that um, gets away from this problematic element of contractuality. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, I'll, I've, been, I've been working on that issue um, uh, in the last weeks. I gave a seminar on sexual consent, actually, um, in France, where we, we talked a bit about the Dominique Strauss-Kahn um, issue and, 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 and how consent was projected and what consent means. Um, uh, so there's lots to be said, but, but let, me, let me just say two things that I think are relevant for us um, this evening. The first is, um, how, how do we think about um, global obligations, ob obligations um, that we, we have to one another as inhabitants um, uh, of, the, uh, of, of the globe um, when, when we're not necessarily part of the same nation state or we're not necessarily part of the same community or we've never entered into an explicit contract with one another. Um, 
and it seems to me that it cannot be the case that we're only ethically obligated to those with whom we are already contracted, i.e. those who, who, um, who belong to the same nation state that we have agreed to join or that, or that we've been um, born into and, and, and legalized um, within. Uh, we, we have to think about um, ethical obligations and political obligations in ways that exceed uh, the terms of contract. Um, it's also true that most forms of contract, not all, um, tend to individualize those who enter into them or um, certain forms of social contract tend to produce ideas of the nation state which are exclusionary. So that produces two, two problems. What, what are my extra national obligations and who am I um, when I am not just an individual? Am I not related to others in ways um, um, for which I need a different kind of political vocabulary? So, um, so that seems terribly uh, important. But, you know, it's always possible um, uh, to say, um, well, I mean, if you think about what happens in sexually progressive circles where people, they make arrangements to have this or that kind of sexual relationship and they co enter into a contract and everyone agrees and then, you know, something happens and someone finds that they're horribly vulnerable in a way that they had no idea. And <laughs> they, they didn't expect it all and they can't be in that contract. And whatever made them think they could be in that contract. Um, uh, <laughs> um, and I mean, it's something we all know, right? And, and it's a kind of, and I also think it's a kind of leftist conceit that, oh, well, we can find the ideal form and then we, we consent to the ideal form and then we live the ideal form because we think it's right and then we find that it's radically unlivable. Um, um, so, so what would it mean, what would it mean, say, in a context like that to return to a different kind of question, like what are the conditions of livability, <laughs> right? What are the conditions of livability and how to communicate them and how to live them, right? Which with, without going back to completely conservative structures or thinking, oh, I guess that social form is actually right. No, I mean, it's really to, instead of asking what, what it is rationally I believe I should be able to do, what are the concrete conditions of livability? I want to say that this question is something that not only pertains to sexual life and the organization of sexuality, but it does pertain to the organization of our, um, our ethical and our, our, our political uh, bonds. Um, especially with those, you know, we don't know or never chose, right? I mean, in a way, we are, we are vulnerable in, in, in ways that we, we can't, that can't be accommodated by ideas of, um, of, 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 of choice and knowledge that are presupposed by contract. We are, we are al already, uh, and before any question of choice, vulnerable to others in, in ways that, um, that, that in effect define us as bodily and social beings. And I'm trying to think, what does that say about our global responsibilities and how might we rethink ourselves as, as global creatures um, in, in light of such a claim? Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Judith. <laughs> Judith, on behalf of all of us, thank you for an extraordinary evening, an extraordinary conversation. Thank you to Charlie and the Georgia Strait. And on behalf of the Peter Wall Institute for Advanced Studies, thank you to, to all of you for joining in the conversation. Um, and uh, 
Uh, thank you for coming and safe travels back and stay posted for um, future lectures of the uh, Wall Exchange. Uh, one's coming up in October about uh, the cosmic universe in the 21st century. But thank you again, Judith.